Hi everyone. Um, just to start off, who has heard of Kick before? Okay, so a few hands. Who has heard of Kin and what we're doing with Kin and Kick? Okay, so one person. Um, yeah, so to start off, I'm going to go through uh, a bit of a background on what Kick and Kin is and um, how we got into the crypto space and then going through how we initially launched this product called Kin into Kick and what we're doing, um, how that went, what the design challenges we had, what, what the implementation looked like and what the results were. And then lastly, I'll talk about some of the next steps. Um, to give you a quick background, since most of you are familiar with Kick, I'll kind of go really quickly over that. But basically, Kick was launched or, or founded in 2009 and launched in, 2000, in 2010. Um, upon launch, we quickly grew to, to about 1 million registrations after 15 days, but there was a little bit of a rocky road um, because we got removed from uh, the BlackBerry store and we were sued by BlackBerry because of um, IP issues. And so after that, we kind of like regained momentum being on Android, iOS, uh, and Windows, and, and over a span of another four years, we were able to raise a lot more money and grow to about 300 million registered users. Um, and then through that experience, that's when Kick acquired the company that I was working at before called Blink, and that's where we kind of introduced bots and Kick, and, and that's where that, we got into that space. Um, but lately, in the last year or year and a half, we've recently got into the crypto space. So Kin is this new cryptocurrency that Kick is getting involved in. So in May of 2017, uh, we publicly announced that we are launching a cryptocurrency called Kin. Um, and we basically publicly released a white paper. And the idea behind KIN was to integrate, um, to present a cryptocurrency that we wanted a lot of digital services to use. And where the value that was created out of this cryptocurrency was shared between the developers that were making the products for users and the users themselves. I'll go a little bit over that um, as we go through the presentation. And so what we did was we had a token distribution event where users could um, basically buy, um, or anybody could actually buy KIN for USD, and we raised about, a, uh, about 100, nearly $100 million. And so um, what I'm going to talk about for this talk is this initial product launch that we did. So what was the first product that we implemented for KIN and KICK? Um, and then I'm going to go into detail about a little bit of our next steps and what we're looking at and all those challenges that are associated with, with launching a crypto product. So. What was, uh, to start off, like, what was the motivation behind KIN? So as most of you are probably familiar with, a lot of apps uh, these days are focusing on kind of an attention-based economy. So that's where you advertise or you basically sell other people your, your, cons your consumer's data in response for better advertisements that you can show to your users. So we wanted to kind of move away from that, and that was the motivation behind KIN. So instead, we wanted to create um, something where we would actually create uh, economic relationships between developers and consumers, and the value would be shared through that. So KIN is this idea where um, we would actually reward users with KIN, which is the cryptocurrency we have, and then also reward developers for causing more KIN to happen. So the three goals behind, or the, three, the mission, or the three goals behind KIN are, as I said, to create that shared economy where users and creators will use KIN every day, to launch KIN into Kick, so Kick is that the messaging app that you guys are familiar with. We want to launch it for mass adoption, but the biggest and interesting piece is we want to jumpstart the economy using something called the KIN Rewards Engine, which is this innovative rewards engine where we will release KIN every day when we start that rewards engine, and any developer that's using it will get rewarded based off of how much KIN or transaction volume they're causing. So I'm not actually going to go into detail because of the, the scope of this talk, but if you guys have questions, I can answer them later on. So before I jump into what our product is, um, who here is like familiar with cryptocurrencies and how they work? Okay, a few. Um, majority, it looks like. Uh, so to start, I'm just going to quickly go through blockchain and what smart contracts are, because it's relevant to how we built the product. So in terms of how blockchain works high level, is somebody will, will request um, basically request a transaction, or, or let's say it's happened in an app or a computer, or you just want to trade, trade a certain currency like Bitcoin or Ether. And so this will get sent to the whole peer-to-peer -peer network, which is basically where, this, where all, on each peer, it, on each node in that network, we store what is called the whole ledger or the whole history of transactions that happen. And so you want to basically add your, your specific transaction to that history of transactions to record, because that, that's your, your goal. Um, and so what will happen is the different nodes will, or different miners, for example, in Bitcoin, um, will compete to confirm that transaction using 
um, using some sort of mathematical formula to prove that they did work. So this is called proof of work in, in the blockchain term, terminology. And so after somebody has proved that they've worked on your on, on confirming your transactions, is they've been they're going to get rewarded with that. And so that's through the transaction cost. And so what happens is it, it's called blockchain because people will your your specific block where your transaction is being confirmed will be added to the full list of ledgers and the next block will have to depend with that mathematical proof of work I talked about. The next block will have to depend on all the previous blocks. So high level, all it means is that you're what, what it means in the context of what I'm talking about is what's natural in the cryptocurrency world is that it takes a long time to do this process. So there is relatively slow transaction um, compared to like Visa or other kind of payment mechanisms. It's relatively slow transaction time. The other piece of information is there's some sort of incentive you need to give to somebody that's mining or confirming your transaction. And so that in the, in the sense of Ethereum, for example, you have to pay like a gas price. I'm sure people have heard of that. Um, so that's the idea behind blockchain. And the other piece that's important um, for this talk is smart contracts. So in the case of cryptocurrency, you're storing transactions, but you can also store um, what is called a smart contract. Is that's an executable piece of code that is confirming some sort of relationship between two parties. So in this case on the board, um, we have someone that wants to buy a house. The smart contract is this piece of code that says this person with this asset is selling this house to this person. And so on the blockchain, instead of having this recorded transaction that happens, it's actually a, a layer of abstraction higher where you're recording this sort of smart contract that happened that I'm selling this piece of asset. So in the context of this talk, KIN, which is the cryptocurrency product we were working on, was what is a smart contract. It works like most other cryptocurrencies, um, but it's a smart contract that is on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And Ethereum is a very, um, I think the second largest uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Um, so it's a platform actually, and Ether is the second largest. But So basically, we were a smart contract on that chain. So now I'm gonna go quickly through what like our initial product launch looked like, and how it felt integrating a crypto product into Kit. So, um, as I mentioned, Kin, Kin originally started off as, or as is currently still a ECG, ERC20 token, which is just the standard protocol for smart contracts on Ethereum, um, on the Ethereum blockchain. And after our token distribution event, we worked on what was we called IPL V1, which was initial product launch V1. And you can see it, it's right here on the, the right side of the screen. All it is was a very basic, you can see your balance, um, you can imagine how easy this was to do. It was just like a, a, um, a front-end app that had a post request to a back-end that just allowed you to get your, your balance. So it was a very simple experience, and you could unlock, depending on your balance, different sticker packs. So the reason I'm showing this is just this was our first implementation to give basically token distribution event participants some sort of touch and feel for Kin. The second one, which was actually the more detailed one that I'm going to go to and talk into and talk more in detail with. Is, was the actual integration that we did with of Kin into Kick. So this is where users would be able to actually earn and spend and transact with real Kin in Kick um, for our messaging app. And the goal was to just introduce Kin to Kick users who have very little understanding of crypto. So, and the other kind of caveat was that we were tasked with about 30 days to complete this project. So um, keep that in mind when we when I'm talking about kind of our, I would say, the somewhat hacky solution, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what the next steps are. So in terms of the design challenges, so right from the start, I talked a little bit about this, but the, the biggest design challenge was the dealing with transaction kin on the Ethereum blockchain. So um, high transaction costs. What I mean by that, it is a few cents. That sounds like not like a lot. Right now, I think it's like 30 cents per transaction. But for us, that's a lot because we're talking about people doing things like buying sticker packs, which is going to be a few cents itself, right? So. Um, which means that the transaction cost like kind of way out, out goes the actual cost of the, the good that they're purchasing. The other thing is long confirmation times. So it can take minutes to hours, to even sometimes days, depending on what, what you're, what, how much you're paying for the transaction uh, to go through. And then lastly, there's potential downtime that you can have with Ethereum. So if you're familiar with Ethereum, um, people do ICOs on it, um, people have, there's also Something I'll talk about a little bit later, like other applications that are using it as a as a as their transaction layer. So there's potential downtime you can have. The other design challenge was the average Kick user has no knowledge of crypto. So we wanted to abstract the whole idea of having a private public key, 
um, you having to use your kind of your private address to sign your transactions. Um, we wanted to abstract all of that information away from them so that it's really easy to understand what 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 you're doing. Um, and then the last one is of course the time to complete. So we actually did consider, even though everything was on Ethereum for Kin, we did consider consider moving away from Ethereum and using another blockchain technology, but we decided against that for a couple of reasons. One was um, the fast time to production. So obviously if you have to use another blockchain, you have to get familiar with it, and then it relates to the second point, which is we had to really use Kin, we would have to do some sort of token migration or some sort of way of basically using another blockchain when all our all of our kin was on Ethereum. And then the last one is we went with an on-chain solution, especially for our first launch. When I say on-chain, that means that all of our transactions happen on the blockchain, as opposed to us like recording some transactions and then just doing one big commit to the blockchain because of compliance. So if we do that kind of off-chain where we record transactions, we become more of like a bank because we are liable for those transactions that are happening. So we thought, how can we do this quickly? It was basically completely on-chain. So then, how did we deal with two issues related to that? One was, how did we deal with private keys? Basically, we decided um, for this version, given the time frame we had, that we would just store private keys encrypted on the, kick um, on the person's device. So what that means is, um, we couldn't store in the cloud because it would create more compliance issues and we'd have to deal with that. Just like I was mentioning, I'm sure people have worked with kind of um, building um, payments apps, you've, you've seen this before. Um, but what that also meant was that if users lost their phone or deleted the app, they would lose their Kin wallet, which was okay for IPLv2 because we weren't worried about um, we were worried about this specific experience because we chose users that this didn't happen, like they wouldn't delete the app or they wouldn't lose their phone. Or and we also were looking at a very small experiment, so a small amount of Kin that we would give them. Um, and then lastly, for dealing with slow transaction times, we basically created our own provider. Um, that would have a pending balance. So we would just display what the pending balance is for two users. So if you made a transaction and it was pending and actually hasn't been confirmed yet, we would just show as if you've actually made the, trans the transaction and we would just monitor it afterwards to make sure that it actually goes through and retry if necessary. So what does the product end up look like for Kin into Kick? So as I mentioned, Kick is a, a messaging app and so we have a bots platform. So we started off with using the, the bot that introduces you to the app called Kick Team with a blast to about, I think it was about a thousand users. And so we just sent them um, like a, hey, you've been selected to this Kick community. Um, do you want to join? And so from that, you can see they get sent a link. And then with that link, um, so there's two flows basically. You could receive Kin or you could spend Kin. So for receiving Kin, um, the Kick Team bot would send you surveys that you could complete, and then you'd receive Kin for doing those surveys. And so, based off of that survey result, we would um, we would send a link saying, um, basically saying, "Hey, you've earned this amount of Kin." And this would happen only on the first time. So, when the user clicks on that, it would pop up a wallet that we control that would say, "Do you want to receive Kin?" And so, from a technical perspective, basically what's happening is the Kick Team web page would pop up and use a um, basically a library, a JS library that we have um, to request uh, for, a, for the wallet to get the public address. And so what's happening under the hood is we had this basically um, native uh, bridge between web code and native code that we would pull up another web, uh, basically another, another, it's like an OAuth flow, we pull up our web wallet that we control that has actual access to the Kik user's wallet. And so when the Kick Team web page asks them, can I get the public address, they'll pull up another, another web page. That web page would, using the Kin plugin and the Kin SDK, actually fetch the public address of the user in, from, from, um, from the wallet, and then it would send it back to, it send back to the web page through a, a, basically a callback in a, the JavaScript, um, in the JavaScript function that you used to call it. And then from there, the web page now has a public address so it can send it to its back end, it can store it, and it can use it for future use. So this specific screen of like, do you want to receive Kin is something that would only happen once. It's basically just like, for the user, we're actually basically, this is where the abstraction is clear. Like we are actually grabbing the person's public address, but for the user, it looks like a confirmation, do you want to receive Kin from the bot? And so after that happens, now we can interact and, and fetch uh, and send as much Kin as we want, because as you probably know with the, uh, with uh, Ethereum, you just need the public address, or, or any cryptocurrency, you just need public address to send 
to send it into the new search. Now, for spending, um, for the spending flow, we had uh, basically stickers you could purchase, as I mentioned um, before. And the way it worked is basically the sticker web page would similarly um, use KinJS or this library that we built to um, open up the wallet and make a request to send Kin to uh, to the sticker shop uh, public address. So it'll say, I want to send Kin to this public address that I'm feeding you. And as I mentioned before, this native bridge would cause another um, web app to, to pull up. If the user confirms that native web wallet that we built um, will, will, will make requests to the blockchain to basically actually send the Kin and return a transaction ID, which gets passed back to the sticker web page. And then now the sticker web page has a transaction ID. It can monitor that, it can confirm the request, it can unlock the sticker pack for, this, for, the, for the user to use. And again, clearly, like what's happening is the user has a wallet underneath that they're stored, but they have no context to it, and it's just signing transactions for the user. So now that that's kind of the high-level implementation of, uh, of what IPL v2 looked like, I want to talk a little bit about how the launch went and how that experience was. So we launched in December, um, of last year, and the initial results were pretty high engagement for us. So we had about 26 of users that were targeted from the Kick Team bot responding with "I'm interested," and I think of the 26 percent, um, in total, 15 percent um, confirmed, which is a pretty good statistic for us because this is from push notification to actually creating a, a wallet and getting the reward. Um, if you think about like advertisement campaigns, that's pretty good considering that um, this. Compared to our other bot engagements, it's, it's a high statistic, and you can obviously scale this and grow this higher. Um, and then of those 15% that basically created wallets, we had about 60% engaged in those earn and spend opportunities. And then in total, I did about a thousand, so a thousand people created wallets. About of those a thousand, we had about average 18 transactions, kin transactions per person. So about 18,000 kin transactions, which is pretty good in the in the crypto space. Also, given that we have. Um, in the order of tens of millions of, act, of monthly active users, and we are we are only targeting about um, 1,000 people. So this is the scope of this project. But the bigger insight that we got for our next version that we're launching is we face some serious challenges with network congestion and transaction costs on Ethereum. So to talk about that, has anybody heard of the kind of crypto kitties craze? Yeah. So basically, what happened is we wanted to launch. The first week of December, um, so that that happened as soon a few days before we wanted to launch. Crypto Kitties came out, and for those that are not familiar, Crypto Kitties is basically a product where you can kind of get digital kitties. You can you can trade and buy them on the Ethereum blockchain, or you could buy them with Bitcoin. So people went like this caused ten percent of Ethereum traffic. So people were going crazy for buying these specific kitties. And what that meant for us, for our small little test that we just wanted to do, we would have to spend, this graph here is the spend of the average transaction cost in USD for Ethereum. So it went from what we expected, which was I talked before, like 30 cents, which we were willing to eat up that cost for our users, to about one and a half dollars. So if you imagine for our 18,000 transactions, it sounds like a small amount for us, but it means that it's about being a test of what we would do if we scaled this up to, to millions of users, we would be spending $1.50 per transaction, which was obviously out of the question. Um, and it also clogged up the network, as you can see. Um, so what that means is, if I decided to make the transaction cost, because you can decide this, your minimum to be like 30 cents, it could take days or even like a week to confirm that transaction. So. By having um, just something as a simple application like CryptoKitties, as a craze on the Ethereum blockchain, completely clogged it up. So what are our next steps? Big solution. So has anybody heard of Stellar before? Yeah, so a few. Basically, Stellar is another blockchain technology. Um, and they're, they have a certain set of advantages over Ethereum. They're not as, uh, I'd say, decentralized, but their focus is on building financial applications with cryptocurrency. So their, their transactions are practically fee, free. So the, co the cost is kind of put somewhere else. So instead of having costs on transactions, which is where Ethereum is focused on, Ethereum is free to completely create a wallet because it's just using cryptography. You're just using a specific digital signature. So um, basically, the transactions are free for Stellar, but it costs to create wallets. So for us, that's better because obviously we're not going to be creating 
we will be creating a lot of wallets, but that's a better cost for us to eat than transaction volume, because that's our goal to get lots of users using it. Um, and also, seller transactions are much faster than Ethereum. So Ethereum, on average, 15 operations per second. So that means like all of the network, like everybody using Ethereum, maximum is 15 transactions per second. Um, whereas Stellar is they at least advertise about a, a thousand operations per second. So nobody's really using Stellar outside of Stellar itself um, for, as this kind of use case. So we're looking and exploring that, and we're investigating basically what is a dual chain solution. So it's where for us it's like internal use. So for internal use for Kick, we're going to use all Stellar transactions. And if you want to liquidate your money or, or go outside of Kick or go to another digital service you can use Ethereum. So the idea will be some sort of like a, a lock and freeze concept. So if I have 10, let's say 10 um, lumens equivalent of kin in Stellar, I can, I would, if I wanted to move that to Ethereum, I would lock that amount in Stellar and then it'll free up, so there'll be this, tra this translation layer, it'll free up 10, um, 10 kin in on Ethereum, on Ethereum blockchain. So it's this idea of like, well, control that the, the total supply will stay the same in both chains. Um, so our next steps for kin is basically we're working digital, diligently on a new kin SDK using Stellar. So we can in integrate that. We're working on kick, uh, we're working on allowing kick users to do more than just buy stickers. And obviously that web interface right now is very, very, very bone. We're working on improving that. And so we're looking at how we can use kin and Stellar in kick. And then we're also working on, so for Kin as well, the idea, the whole long-term vision behind Kin is not to just have Kick use it, Kick is like our launch pad, um, but we're looking at having other select digital partners join the community. So, so that's it, there's two links uh, there, the GitHub, um, basically the GitHub uh, organization for Kin Foundation, which would be helpful if you want to see some of, a lot of the source code for this project. And then um, we have a Medium blog for Kin Foundation as well, which has um, a lot of, almost, all the information that I discussed here, and I probably will even post this stuff there too. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, the, the big motivation behind blockchain is this, um, essentially it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the coolness of how we can basically reward users without actually spending real money. So if we were to do this with real money right now, we, we couldn't create these innovative um, structures to encourage developers, we couldn't create without spending money. Basically, so it's this innovative nature, which actually you can talk about with the Kin Rewards engine of how we can kind of reward people or reward developers to use um, to use Kin. And so the idea behind that is let's let's it's it's basically like it's, it's think of it like a loyalty point system on the blockchain as opposed to having a um, having a kind of currency do it. And this point system, we want users to think of it like a point system. This will allow us to 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 handle like the, the complexity of creating a point system by just leveraging the, the, the work of others. Essentially, yeah. Somebody tells them that you would award the point system. Yeah. Exactly. And so creating value. So we did some investigation with what we call kick points, like creating value in an economic structure, which is what we did originally with kick points, is what we wanted to do. Um, we even tried that, so I have some slides on that as well. We tried to do kick points, which is basically what Kin is right now, but it was hard to give it an economic value behind it. Whereas now we're seeing like we can create an economic value behind a point system, which is basically what Kin is right now and what it will look like. Um, but it was basically that translation from being creating an economic value around a point system was hard, and we found it this was the best way for us to do it. Yeah, so we, a couple of things actually. Stellar is our, our next step. Um, we actually are working with another company called Orbs. Um, so kind of the structure of Kin is we have a Tel Aviv office as well, and Orbs is another kind of organization that we're working with. And um, a lot of, there's actually a lot of shared resources between there, but that's like a long-term vision. So 
what can we do as an immediate next step with Stellar is what we kind of evaluated. To be honest, I'm not the expert on the blockchain technologies and why we chose it, um, but we found that that was the next best step for us. You're talking about sticking your rewards and things, but but longer term, are you expecting people to spend like ten bucks at that level, or are you ever concerned somehow somebody's going to lose a thousand million dollars? Yeah, so here you buy a it's a good question. Um, right now, the vision is so we are looking at more expensive goods. Of course, I think stickers was just like your quickest test to do. Um, but our focus is really on um, kind of mass adoption of this. So how can we get people spending a smaller amount of goods? Because right now the whole idea behind like trading lots of uh, lots of like money for Ethereum is kind of done before. So we're looking at like smaller smaller base goods. So to give you an example, like the next and, and digital assets is another big focus of ours. So the next the next thing we're going to iterate through is like people spending on themes or theming of that kind of store or so other things that they kind of spend in current existing and digital apps. Yeah. yeah, so our I can tell you like our demographics, so we're very we skew very young. Um, so that's another reason why this is like easier for us to do than a payment system because our younger demographic just so don't young, like twelve years old or, or like uh, basically teenagers. So like that's think that. teenagers. So think like thirteen to eighteen. Um, like how can we basically give them access to it and by not posing it as a cryptocurrency and more of a point system where you get rewarded and then you can spend on it, it's easier for us to get into that audience. And we're going to monitor as well. So we're very concerned about people using this like kin in their app for kind of like not as favorable purposes. And so with our kin rewards engine that we talked about, each of those will have to know the customer that we're working with that's going to get the rewards because it's going to obviously spiral, especially if you're familiar with the crypto space, like it can spiral out of control for the purpose of what you're using it. Yeah. Yes? So, uh, did you have any passage of older cryptocurrency um, episodes like two weeks ago? No, I didn't. So this might be a, but how do you, how do you address the trust issue? Like, because there, there seems to be a little bit more um, attack on cryptocurrency as far as uh, what people are doing with it. Uh, is there is there an issue? Can you address the yeah. trust? Like how how well have you? Good question. Right. No, this is like actually a really big focus of our company is about how we can be as compliant as possible with cryptocurrency and with the government. Um, so what we're doing is for a smaller. That's why we're actually focusing on smaller transactions for users, where trust is not basically you're buying smaller goods and you're buying smaller things, and we're controlling the supply of what you're buying, and then for trust of basically bigger bigger people that were basically bigger companies, we're gonna to have to do a very due diligence like know your customer process. So if a customer, for example, another company wants to use kin, like right now we can completely control it because we're it's in our in our app, right? So we can control we can know we know our users, we're connecting users to kick accounts, kin accounts, so we have complete knowledge of who our user is. But when we work with other other um, other apps, they're gonna to have to do such we're gonna to have to do a due diligence process with them to make sure that they're doing this for basically reasons that fit our terms and service, reasons that fit like why we are launching this as a product. And so there's gonna be some sort of due diligence process there. Um, so it's a little bit different than a cryptocurrency you would think. Um, it's more of like how can we integrate it into apps. It's like decentralized but under control. Yes. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yeah, so there won't be an actual conversion cost because we're gonna like basically um, cause the cost of the actual two to be the same, just like how we can control that because um, of basically how like smart contracts will work. But there will be costs that we are gonna incur, such as the creation wallet costs for Stellar, the um, like transaction costs, and that's the cost that we're thinking of. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why we kind of were motivated to move to Stellar because the costs are much lower. Yeah. Yes. How do you know your user base? Sorry? How do you know your user base? 
Oh no, so that's, see, I'm talking about controlling kin in, in kick, basically on that, in that, in that aspect. Like outside of kick and, and that, is, you're right, you can't really control, control that like any other cryptocurrency. Yeah. Or also who we're dealing with. So when I say the kin is a rewards engine, that's where we're rewarding actually other companies for using kin. We can control that because we have the knowledge of like who we're rewarding. Who we're working with. Yeah. So right now the wallet is connected to your kick account, at least for this first version. So just like username, password um, uh, for accessing the same, basically the same authentication we use for kick we're using for the wallet. Yes. So that's where we're, so obviously we haven't figured that out completely because that's a hard problem to solve. Um, that's where we will kind of have to rely on like pending, pending balances. So the idea is like you cause, you you posted this transaction to the to the blockchain, and we're just going to assume it happened. And if we get out of sync errors, we're going to handle it later for for you. Any current cost that would happen if that happens. Yes. So yes, yeah, so the reason we chose to do such approaches is because we don't have to deal with the compliance now, but we're gonna have to deal with it when we decide to move forward. So that's what we're dealing with right now, right? So we're basically just, how could we, the, the, this talk was like, how could we launch it as quickly as possible as what we did? Which was also the reason we did this was for compliance reasons. We, we had to show that um, KIC, like KIN itself was like not, was something useful that people could use as opposed to an investment. Thank you.